Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Victoria Perry. I'm Deputy Director in the Fiscal Affairs Department at the IMF. And I am extremely pleased to be moderating this third in our series of gender podcasts, Tadat Gender Podcasts. We have two really interesting guests with us today. First, we have Doris Ackle, who is a Senior Policy and Engagement Advisor for the International Center for Tax and Development, ICTD, their DigiTax program. But she's also an experienced Tadat Assessor, very appropriately. She has more than 25 years of experience in tax policy and administration. She held a number of positions in the Uganda Revenue Authority um, until she retired from the Revenue Authority as the Commissioner General and member of the Board of Directors, which she, a position she held until uh, March of 2020. In that position, she was also a member of um, the Council of African Tax Administra Administrators for, for ATAF. And our other guest is Deborah Jenkins, Deputy Commissioner for Small Business at the Australian Tax Office. As part of that role, she has responsibility for managing the Goods and Services Tax Program. Um, she has a strong focus on making it easy for small businesses to operate using digital products and services. Before she joined the ATO, uh, Deborah was a partner at a large advisory firm advising domestic and international clients on GST-related matters. So we're very lucky, especially that Deborah could join us as it's to, uh, quite late at night in Australia as we taped this. So we are very grateful to both Doris and Deborah for being with us. So without more, I want to jump right into our uh, hearing from our guests. So to get us started, each of you, um, we'd like to hear a little more about your background. That is what led you into your work, um, the work that you've been doing, um, and how did gender play any role in that, if at all? Um, so maybe, uh, Deborah, if you'd like to kick off, then we'll turn to uh, Doris. Certainly, and thank you very much for having me. Um, my background actually started out uh, in New Zealand as a, a graduate in New Zealand's Inland Revenue Department. And it's probably not one of those things you think, when I grow up, I want to be a tax administrator. Or I'm sure there's lots of little girls out there, and, and actually my daughter does. She does want to work in tax. Um, but my journey started there, and then I went um, on to work in a law firm, and then I went to an, an accounting firm. Um, and then I spent some time in Australia and in Europe um, looking predominantly at value-added tax at VAT um, before coming back to Australia uh, where I made partner. I was a GST partner. And then I felt this, you know, I really wanted to give back. And um, it just felt like the right time five years ago to join the Australian Tax Office. So I started in a GST role, um, but now I'm absolutely um, delighted to be looking after 4.2 million Australian small businesses um, and thinking about how we can design tax and super system, superannuation systems that actually make it um, easy to comply and, and hard not to. Um, but if I think about my personal life, I think I mentioned my, my little girl then, so I've got a, an eight-year-old and a nine-year-old. Um, and so that keeps me busy. Um, and in the weekends, uh, we play rugby union here in Australia and parts of Australia. And being a Kiwi, of course, uh, uh, my national team. And so I manage the under eights in my spare time. So uh, did gender play a role? Look, um, I don't even, you know, I'm very, very lucky where I am at the ATO at the moment. But over the course of my career, I've been in, in different organisations where gender lens has been quite different. So I'm really excited to be here today to chat with you. Thanks, Deborah. Doris, let's hear from you about how you wound up being commissioner of the uh, Uganda Revenue Authority. Thank you very much, Vicky. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this call um, with both of you, Deborah and Vicky. Um, I started out at the Uganda Revenue Authority very early in my working life, um, in 1995, actually. And I started out from the bottom of the you know, the ladder. And I was really just being a good lawyer. I was, I joined uh, URA to do the legal work in the tax administration. So I was doing legal work, 
policy advisory, uh, legislative drafting, the reform of the laws, seeing how all these different laws can be uh, interpreted to support revenue collection. And that was predominantly the role that I played. Um, gradually, um, especially after getting my master's degree, um, I was given higher responsibilities, um, planning roles, and I also took on roles in senior management. So it's at that point that I began to get more involved in other aspects of tax administration that were not just um, you know, legal aspects. I got involved in drafting uh, policies for the organization. I got involved in uh, other administrative roles, uh, managing the procurement functions. And so when the position for Commissioner General became available in 2014, um, Someone nudged me and said, but you can do this. You've, had, you've been in-house counsel for all these years. You've been in-house counsel for 19 years. You can actually be commissioner general. You've seen various aspects of, of URA and how it um, does tax administration in the country. So I gave it a shot. And lo and behold, uh, there I was as commissioner URA. And uh, I did that for five and a half years. Roller coaster, uh, typically swimming with the sharks type of experience. But oh my goodness, a very, very enriching experience. How did gender, how did gender help? Um, luckily for us, luckily for us in Uganda, and I say this uh, with a lot of respect for other, other countries, luckily for us as a professional woman, I never ever experienced any differences in perspective between me and my male colleagues. So I had, equal opportunities, equal chances at everything, and my career growth um, did not in any way, um, I was not favored in any way because of being a woman. So all the things that I was able to do, it's because of my abilities and my professional growth. But that is because in Uganda, we have a very, what can I call it, open-minded um, look into women, professional women, giving their all and being given equal opportunities. It did help that I had um, similar gender bosses who were able to understand some of the challenges that we as professional women go through when doing work and did not hold those things against us. From a family background, I have very small children. I'm one of those that are late bloomers, if it is uh, so to speak. Uh, my eldest is uh, eight years old, soon to be eight, and I have twins, twin sons, uh, who are just two and a half years old, and all three are boys. So that's um, that's all about me. Thank you. Wow. Twin boys who are two and a half will really keep you busy. I can, I can only imagine. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, Doris, that actually leads me, what you said is really interesting about Uganda. Um, really, I was going to ask you, Uganda really has made impressive progress on advancing gender equity. Um, and can you share any insights with us on the link between such gender equity and Uganda's striving for sustainable development? That is, what is it that's made Uganda do well in the gender equity sphere compared to various other places we could think of. Um, thank you. I think because we, we from a long way back, when we did uh, the current constitution that we have, and the, through the constitution making process, the, the, the ideas, the men and women who are behind that process were deliberate in ensuring that um, women were given, and, and I know gender is not only women, but in this perspective, I'm going to refer to it as women, that women were actually given a front seat in the running of the affairs of the country. So when the constitution was passed, there are certain quotas that were mandated and obligated on public offices, um, parliamentary positions, uh, women going to the university were given extra affirmative action to ensure that women and girls are able not only to enroll for school, but to stay in school. And when they get into school, they're able to reach the highest levels of learning if they do so wish. Um, child marriages were uh, outlawed, and this enabled so many girls to stay in school and become professional women. 
So over the years, we've begun to see the results of that affirmative action. We've had lots of um, women in public positions. Our parliament is almost a third uh, comprised of women. Our current cabinet, uh, I was just telling Cindy the other day that our current cabinet just passed the other day is 45% women and, you know, about um, maybe just about 33% of those are very senior high cabinet positions. What does that mean? It means that gradually as a country, we have the barriers, the call it psychosocial barriers that have kept the women down have kind of begun to recede. And because of this, the policies that are being made, um, the perspectives that are out there, there's a lot of recognition that it's important to allow women to, 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 to get involved in decision making, given uh, empowerment in all aspects, especially economic empowerment. And I think this has set us apart in the region, certainly in the region, certainly on the continent. Uganda was the first African country to have a female vice president. We now have the second female vice president. I know there are others on the continent right now, but that was a bold statement that was made by the country. And I think it has contributed significantly to realization of our sustainable development goals. We may not be there yet, but because we have all these women and call it um, gender centric policies, um, there is a lot of progress being made on realization of girls in school, female, female literacy, and also women in decision making positions. Wow, great story. Um, and thanks. So, Deborah, Australia has, uh, at a different end of the uh, sort of um, economic uh, development or, you know, um, wealth spectrum, Australia, too, has invested in gender equity for some time. So could you tell us a bit about that? How has that been done? How is it paying off? Um, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, absolutely. No, you're right. I mean, Australia has strived to be an international leader um, on gender equality and also women's empowerment for uh, many, many years. And we're certainly really strongly committed to pursuing gender equality outcomes. And that's, you know, both domestically here at home and doing our part internationally to see what we can do there. And we're certainly at the forefront of efforts to empower women and girls and, and like Doris, in this particular discussion, I am using um, males and females, but obviously acknowledging um, there are other lenses that we could use. But to promote um, gender equality in also in particular in the Indo-Pacific, we're part of you know that region and also around the globe. Um, our foreign policy white paper um, makes it clear that gender equality is you know a priority and a core foundational value um, here in Australia. And you know that's a, a foundation upon which we we do build our international engagement is the right thing to do it's the fair thing to do um, and you know it really does add Doris's story is wonderful isn't it but it really does add to that cohesive society um, and you know it's it's really important to us here in Australia but you know look I think there's some things that we can do at home in in the organization that I work in so at the Australian Taxation Office for example we have a gender equality action plan um, and we also have a diversity and inclusion plan as well and you know that's really our formal commitment it's it's the signpost that we give to the community um, and to our stakeholders about how we're going to conduct ourselves um, the gender um, equality action plan actually outlines how we're going to do it and you know it's it's fundamental things like flexible work practices it's um, you know about how can we be more innovative and and certainly through COVID um, which um, we're actually just uh, in, in a lockdown, quasi lockdown situation here in, in Sydney at the moment. Um, but, you know, I think it has really fast forwarded a lot of those things because we actually have had that flexibility really just happening in the workplace. And, it, uh, you know, in many ways, people have said it's kind of leapt us, leapt us forward. Um, but, you know, at the ATO, 57% of our ATO executives, so our, our seven executives are, are female. Um, and in terms of the, the leadership, so close to 58% of our entire workforce are female. Um, and then our senior leadership is, uh, I think it's around 47%. 
percent. So you can see it's hovering around that fifty percent, which is you know pretty amazing. And when we look at it through the lens of um, the gender pay gap as well, um, at the ATO it's close to five percent. So I think it's four point eight percent, whereas um, in the national average is fourteen. So obviously we'd love it to be zero, um, but you know I think it's 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 a pretty amazing achievement, and you know we're working on practical things. You know how can we have those flexible work policies? How can we look through the different lens and really strive? We're looking at our twenty twenty four goals for diversity and inclusion, and you know. The thing, and I think Doris kind of alluded to it as well, um, this is not just about women and what we can do. It's actually making sure that, you know, men have a, you know, an equal say and, an, you know, and, and at home here, um, you know, my my partner, my husband is, is uh, you know, very much it's, it's being equals and that's really what we're all about. Thanks. Thanks. Um, that uh, sort of prompts me to ask both of you, maybe, starting with Doris, reflecting on what Deborah was saying, what role does a tax administration play in achieving equity, in your view? Um, and uh, that could mean in, in any sphere, in itself, you know, outside, in the government. So, um, Doris, what do you think? Thank you. I think as a tax, a tax administration is one of those... Um, and I call it very prominent public uh, sector organizations. So any policies that it makes um, would actually, can I say, make a loud statement about how um, a country or how a society has been deliberate about gender equity. So internally, at least with the experience of URA, I think ensuring that we have a good proportion of the staff of the employees as women but also putting in um, some policies that encourage women not only to work at very low levels but also to take up uh, managerial positions leadership positions while not affecting um, their other spheres of life really to ensure that they have a work-life balance so um, enabling women who are childbearing age to be able to have their children, but also to do their work. Um, but also from the perspective of in administration is a repository of knowledge. And in our circumstances as a low-income country, there are so many things that a tax administration can do uh, to enable, especially the women in business, society in general, to be able to have the knowledge, bridging the knowledge gaps to allow people to do business well. An example I can give is that um, internally, we had uh, we, we were deliberate about putting in place a, call it a club, a club for women to be able to share experiences and tell, and tell the management what it is that you would like to be seen to be done better. And where is it that uh, perhaps we need to, to, what do we need to stop doing, but also using the club to impact the community. So that, that was very successful. From the business side of it, uh, we were deliberate about in the tax clinics that we organized, especially for the small businesses, which predominantly in low-income countries, and Uganda in particular, are run by women. We we were deliberate about having women conferences, women in business conferences, women in business conventions, to teach them the basics of record keeping, the basics of managing a business well, the basics of being able to comply for your tax obligations and not have that stand in the way of business growth. We didn't lock the men out, but we thought that because of all the barriers that women face, this it would be a good thing to have at least once a year a tax clinic or a tax convention for women in business. And I think that's an important aspect, that a lesson that I can pick on to show what a tax administration can do. Um, for simplified reporting, again, many this helps mostly the small and medium enterprises, which are predominantly run by women and also other, call them vulnerable groups, the, the youth and maybe the elderly. Uh, having putting in place simplified um, returns 
or, or compliance regimes that they are able to, especially those from customs, Deb, Deborah, you would relate to this, how can they clear their goods at customs without having to go through the whole rigmarole, which is really complicated, of clearing agents and the, you know, the declaration forms. So those kinds of simplified regimes, compliance regimes, is another thing that tax administrations can do to promote equity. At least those are the lessons that I can pick from what we did at URA, and I'm sure that um, many other people would resonate with things like this. Thanks. Thanks. Um, come back to a little bit of that a bit later, but Deborah. Um, Deborah, what what do you think? How do you see the tax administration playing a role in it, in achieving better equity? Yeah, I, I look. I think Doris picked up on some really interesting things. There's sort of the role that you can play as a role model, and you know, similarly, we are a, a very big and important department, and so the things we do are really important. I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, there's also how we can. So we are the in Australia. We have we're the administrator, so we um, implement the policy. And we have the Treasury who is um, the, the policy agency. And, um, you know, for, for me, when I think about that, it's the role that we play in linking our information with um, the, the um, sort of child support agencies and the other agencies. I think, Doris, you touched on this a little bit, but also, you know, we hold a lot of data and information that we can use to inform government about, you know, how the citizens are behaving and, and what that looks like. And, and over time, I think we're getting better about that and realising actually this data that we hold is, is a national asset that we can actually use to, to help, um, you know, government inform some of those tax policies and the implications of some of those tax policies as well. So there's sort of that lens, uh, Victoria, of being, the, you know, the administrator but, you know, touching on what Doris was talking about earlier, uh, there's a lot of things that, that we can do about making sure that everything we do is best practice. From recruitment, you know, how do we get rid of bias? How do we make sure the language that we're using in our, um, you know, our advertisements is inclusive language? Um, you know, how do we make sure that decisions aren't being made, um, you know, unconsciously? You know, the unconscious bias is obviously one of those big challenges all organisations face, but it's something that we've been thinking a lot about. And there's a program that we have that I, I just think is fantastic and we call it Opening Doors. And I have recruited a lot of people through that. And the idea of that is, you know, we have people who come through the well-trodden path, but there are people... Um, you know, particularly in, in countries like Australia, who may have taken some time out of the workforce, highly qualified, highly skilled women who might have young children at home and have taken some time out and want to come back into the workforce with more flexible um, policies like, for example, time off in school holidays. And so, you know, that's been a, a really important way of us thinking about how do we access that incredible talent that's out there that might not otherwise come into our organisation. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, we have the Gender Equality Action Plan Plan and, and those other things as well. But, you know, for us, it's about how do we role model the behaviours that we want to see in society? Um, because if we do that, you know, it, it just really does mean that we do that. At an international level, of course, you know, it's participating in events like this, uh, bringing it to the fore. And, and, you know, we're on the OECD Gender uh, Balance Network. And, you know, so it's about talking about these things and, you know, hearing Doris, isn't that so inspiring? And I'm thinking, oh, well, I want to speak to other women um, and men across the globe and find out how they do it and how we can learn from them. So those are the things that, that we've been doing, Victoria. Thanks. Um, one thing that's really interesting to me uh, in Australia is that Australia recently introduced a women's budget with the idea of fueling economic growth. Can you tell us a little bit about that? How, what kind of a shift is that for Australia? And does ATO have any role to play in sort of aligning with that in any way? I mean, as I mentioned previously, the Australian government has always had a strong commitment um, to, to uh, pursuing the, the gender equality outcomes. But, but as you mentioned, um, we had measures in the recent 2021 20, um, 2122 budget that was just in May that's our federal budget that build upon that and and we do have the 2018 and the 2020 women's economic statements um, and there were um, things established such as the women's cabinet task force 
So within that, and I'll just make some high-level comments about the budget itself because there are some measures that we as the as the tax office would need to, to um, implement. You know, um, there is things about women's safety, um, economic security, health and wellbeing, because it's the whole package of things that the Australian government wants to deliver, um, you know, to make it, you know, a very important part. And and women's economic security, and Doris, I think you, you touched on this as well, looking at the women who run small businesses, um, you know, they, they really um, are the entrepreneurs, they are the innovators um, a, across the society. And so, you know, there are about $1.9 billion worth of measures aimed at progressing um, women's economic security and you know we are looking at how we can make sure that women have um, equal access to things like superannuation um, so that's you know saving for your future and um, how do we as the administrator um, of that particular regime play that and so I think superannuation is sort of one of those planks um, that come through uh, that we administer as well and there's a whole lot of detail underneath that and we probably don't have time to go into it today but it is in some of that complexity of the administration that that the Australian government really wants to make sure that it is fair it is equal um, and that women um, have that economic security uh, so that they can continue, continue to contribute um, to society. Very good. Doris, you you started touching on you started to touch on this, and when you were, I asked you about the role of the tax administration in equity. But how do you think, or do you think, that um, a tax administration can actually be a change agent uh, to help increase women's participation in the economy? And you did start to talk about that, and I thought it was really interesting. Um, so, if you could elaborate a little more on that, it would be great. Yeah, thank you. I think. Um like I mentioned before, because the tax administration is in touch, is in touch with, you know, the, the pulse, the pulse of how the economy is doing, we are able, or the tax administration is able to pick up um, certain policy actions that must be taken to encourage or to promote equity. Um, there, is, there are lots of implicit biases in some of the policies and the way the laws are made. And these are issues that the tax administration can pick up on and, you know, work to, to remove some of these uh, implicit biases in the laws and in the policy. Um, <clears throat> for example, um, the, 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 we, we usually talk about, um, for example, taxation of income. And you, feel, you, you find that um, for, for women who are perhaps uh, low-income earners, because of the way it, the, the income tax regime is, is maybe designed, you may find that they, they, they face a higher effective tax rate burden than their, their male colleagues who will tend to be perhaps in higher income uh, brackets because you know, they're they are, they are in higher positions. For VAT, and these are implicit biases, it's not that the, that the system is designed specifically to promote bias, but these are some of the implicit biases. For VAT, if you look at uh, a way a VAT system is designed, if there is some deliberate effort by the government to exempt uh, items that are commonly purchased by women, then you kind of, um, and, and this information can come from the tax administration, that when we look at the businesses that women are running, perhaps they spend a lot on A, B, C, and D. So if the VAT regime takes that into consideration and maybe gives lower rates or exempt some of these as, uh, items from, from high VAT rates, then that could also promote equity. So this is information that the tax administration has and is able to advise the government um, to do that. Again, um, women in, in tax administration, how, because there are all these other, can I call it the ripple effect, the, 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 the ripple effect, if a tax administration is able to, to advise the government to make gender-centric policies that support the growth of equity, or, or I'm, I'm just using the word growth in equity, but maybe improvements in equity for women in various other sectors of the economy. Uganda is a predominantly agricultural economy. And the women that, uh, it's women that form the bulk of the labor in the agricultural sector. 
what kind of policies can be put in place by the government to enable these women who are running in an informal agricultural sector economy also thrive as well as their colleague counterparts in formal employment you know minimum wage discussions um, are they are being are they being paid at the rates that they should be paid for the labor that they are given are women who who stay home do they get um, do they get some recognition or some value attached to the services that they they they, they, they render at home and and how do these factor in the whole tax uh, design how the, 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 the design of the tax system we we recently discovered that there is a huge burden on market women um, who pay informal taxes because they they go to the toilets more often than their male colleagues you know and because of that because the toilets are paid for in you know in, in societies like ours there's someone who runs the public toilet and and, and you have to pay uh, to to access the public toilet so because women are going to the toilet more often they are paying much more than their male counterparts and and this has a bearing on how much money is left in her pocket to be able to do other things so if a, a tax administration is able to pick up on this it can inform the policies that are being made the way these markets are being run for example what other systems are being put in place that remove these implicit burdens that women face and and gradually when these barriers are reducing we we, we think that um th there is change that is actually being made from from a perspective like ours all three of us have been uh, are women professionals in the tax field how can a tax administration be a change agent? By making people like you, myself, Vicky, Vicky, you're one of the role models. Put the women out there. They can do it. Let them go to the highest levels uh, and serve in, in, in areas which are predominantly male-dominated. Um, Uganda has had a history of three women's sieges, but you find very many African countries that have not had that. How many women are in leadership positions at the IMF, for example? These are some of the things that tax administrations can be deliberate about pushing the women to take up such positions. Women in capacity building and technical assistance missions. How many of those are being led by women? And gradually when we see changes like this happening, I think there's a ripple effect that begins to um, create the mass that we need. And that is where the change begins to happen. Thanks really interesting examples and really, really important observations, I think. I found it interesting that both of you referred to the, the tax administration's role through the massive amounts of information that it has. And I think it was Deborah who said it's a national asset. And it, both of you have talked about ways that, innovative ways of using that information to try to advance um, gender equity, among other things, I'm sure. So I, I thought that was really interesting from a tax administration perspective, too. Well, we're almost out of time, but I do have just a last broad question and picking up on something Doris just said. As community leaders in your, in your two communities, what advice would you want to share with other countries who are trying to move their gender uh, equity at uh, the gender equity agendas forward. Um, this is both of your societies, as we've just heard, um, have moved very deliberately in this area. So what advice would you have for others um, that may not have been quite so deliberate? Maybe start with you, Deborah, and then finish with uh, Doris. Absolutely. Um Look, I'll just quickly pick up on something that Doris did um, when I was thinking about women in those leadership roles. And I was actually just thinking about my own career as she was talking and thinking about, you know, the champions and people who have actually pushed me forward when I didn't want to go forward. And it just uh, just made me smile, Doris, because sometimes I think uh, I'm my own worst enemy and I was just thinking, you know, how they... You know, and so that is about having champions, male and female, um, in society uh, to make sure that it's everybody's issue because it really is an economic issue. But probably there's four things I would touch on here. We need to have um, to, to, to really move that dial, which is, is what we're all really keen to do. We've actually got to be 
very clear about what we are going to do. It's all well and good for us to say, oh, yeah, no, we want, we have a commitment to it, but what are you going to do and how are you going to do it? And I think having those measurements in there is really, really important and holding yourself accountable to that. I think, you know, when I think about our gender equity action plan and the diversity inclusion plans that we've got, they are very public statements of what our plan is and we're held to account. I think the next thing I would say is review it and review it regularly because things change. Um, you know, can you be a little more ambitious? Can you articulate it in a different way? You know, how, how are you tracking and how should you be tracking? The third thing I would say is also listen to the feedback. And if I think about over the years, you know, the people who we've got the best feedback from, our people are just such an incredible resource. And, you know, we have things like our employee census where our people tell us how we're doing and they're very honest about that. Um, and sometimes it's a bit uncomfortable. But, you know, listen listen to those people. And then, you know, and I think we're very lucky, Doris, that we have governments who are incredibly supportive of what we're doing and um, you know and, and it really is you know if you can get the governments on board and committed um, to this obviously as agencies it makes our job you know so much easier and, and I'm very very privileged to, to I work and to be a, a public servant in a, in a country like Australia where there's a clear government commitment to the mandate so yeah you know be very active, be very clear and articulate what you want to do, um, review it regularly, listen to your people and, and, and get your government on board. Thanks. Uh, Doris, what do you think? What would you advise other countries? Yeah, uh, very similar to what Deborah has said. I think it starts out by a, a, a country being deliberate about a, an agenda being deliberate about the agenda of being gender centric. Um, what does this actually mean? It means that in the design of the national development policies, the national development plans, there must be effort, there must be focus being placed on designing metrics that actually tell a story that the country is, is, is putting its weight behind increasing equity, gender equity. So, what are the metrics that a country would decide in their own you know, setting that if we did this, it means we have moved a step forward in improving gender equity. And once those metrics have been put in the plans, then they can be measured, uh, would be able to measure whether we are making progress or maybe we are not making progress. So it's important for the measure, measuring of progress against those metrics also to be put in the, in, in, in the planning uh, cycle. Um, quarters. Uh, Designing systems where you mandate or obligate certain quotas, maybe 30% of, of, of all your leadership positions must be given to women. Or I don't know how many girls from which uh, district in our setting, or which province in, in, in different settings which are maybe disadvantaged would get government sponsorship or government scholarships for higher education. You know, those kinds of quotas would also help in, in improving um, uh, gender equity. Um, role modeling, we cannot underestimate the impact of role modeling. For those countries that have a wealth of role models, they need to be able to put these role models front and center because they have a huge impact in, in, inspiring, in inspiring so many other people who would like to be just like, like the role models. So in the context of, 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 of women, women empowerment, if you have a wealth, the country has a wealth of women that have succeeded in various aspects. It doesn't have to be only leadership. It can be in education, in science, in engineering, in technology. Let these women, let the government be deliberate about making these women role models so that they can inspire others to be like them. And gradually as the role, the pool of role models increases, then you know that you're actually making progress. I think those are some of the um, suggestions that I can put forward. That is very inspiring. I'll just, I'm certainly not gonna try to summarize what, what went on here today, which I just found incredibly interesting myself. But I do think it's interesting, given that this is a Tadat podcast, that both Deborah and Doris uh, in their last statements did put an emphasis on 
putting in place things you can actually measure. And of course, that's what we do in Tadat. So it all ties together. I think it is very true. If you can't measure something, you can't know that you're moving forward. So that was a really interesting point to me. With that, um, let me close by just thanking you both for taking the time to share all this with us today. I know that our listeners are really interested, are going to be very, very interested in what you've, what you've both said. And uh, we really appreciate you, uh, you doing this and sharing with us. So thank you. And thanks to everybody for listening today.